If he breathes, the bear will see him. Lying flat on his stomach, the boy has no choice but to watch as the hulking brute eats his father before his very eyes. Lying in the thicket just a few trees away, the boy knows that any small movement he makes could prove fatal. A bear this large, hunting for its hibernation, will have no issue chasing him down in a split second and doing exactly what it did to his father, to him. The boy is utterly powerless. All he can do is stay deathly still and watch. They'd found the tracks too late. On the way back to camp, they'd been following the wooded cliff that lines the ocean's edge. Bows and salmon slung over their shoulders, they'd been so proud of their catch and the prospect of bringing it back to the tribe that they hadn't kept their wits about them. By the time they'd seen the enormous prints in the dirt, the sound of lumbering footsteps were already echoing through the trees behind them. The boy's bow is too far out of reach. He dropped it when his father pushed him into the thicket. He's got the knife hanging at his side, but he doubts it's long enough to even get through the bear's fatty hide. In contrast, the only thing protecting him from its bite is the leather hide slung across his shoulders and a woven garment from the tribe's elders. One slash of the bear's claw, and he'd be… A breeze ruffles his hair. The boy's eyes widen in horror. That wind hadn't come from in front of him, but from behind, blowing his scent, his fear, directly towards the bear's nostrils. The boy plants his muddy palms into the dirt, staring at the animal. Its nostril twitches, then twitches again. It half turns its head, sniffing the air. Maybe it won't bother with him. The bear's turning back to its meal already. The boy lets out a sigh of relief, and a twig snaps. The bear snarls and whips its head around. For a second, the two of them lock eyes, predator and prey. Then the boy takes off running. Fast as he can, he leaps through the undergrowth, ferns and nettles whipping at his shins. He fumbles the knife out of its sheath and slings the water skin off his shoulder, throwing it wildly behind him. He doesn't know if he hit the bear. He doesn't have time to turn around and see. It's going to be on him in an instant. Up ahead, he sees sunlight streaming through the thick trees, the cliff edge. If he can just get to that, maybe he can climb down and… No, there's no time. Besides, bears are better climbers, better swimmers, better runners. All the boy can hope for is that he's a better jumper. Him and the boys from the tribe have left off plenty of cliffs along the shore, but never these ones. There are too many rocks, too many shallows. But the thundering of four enormous paws behind him is looming larger and larger. He can almost feel the bear's hot breath on the back of his neck. There's nothing for it. Here goes. The trees clear, the sun blasts his skin, a claw slashes at his back, and the boy launches himself into the air. The wind carries him. The weightlessness of wheeling his arms and legs through the empty sky is almost enough to make him laugh with joy, until the boy looks down. The cliff is higher, much, much higher than he'd realized. His momentum carries his torso forwards into a tumble. He's not going to land straight, and he can see jagged rocks everywhere beneath him. The boy closes his eyes and crashes into the sea. All of the air is slammed out of his lungs. His knee hits something hard and sharp in the water. A swell throws him away from the shore and pulls him deep. Without air in his chest, he can't float. Kicking hard as he can, the boy swims upwards, eyes still screwed shut. His face bashes into a sandy rock. No, that's not upwards. Which way is it? Which way should he swim? The ocean current rolls him over and over. Darkness fills his mind. But his feet find a hard surface, and he pushes against it, launching himself through the water, kicking as hard as he can. The darkness fades. Light. The boy's head breaches the water, and he splutters for air, rubbing the water out of his eyes. He looks around wildly. The sea has carried him away from the cliff and out into open water. It's lifting and dropping him with each wave, carrying him this way and that, like a flower in the wind. And there, traversing the cliff face, scrambling down the rocks, is the bear. The boy's stomach turns. It reaches the bottom of the cliff and sees him there in the water. Tipping back its head, it roars at an almighty volume deafening the boy over the sound of the waters. Even from this distance, the animal looks impossibly large. It dwarfs the boulders that line the water's edge. It slips into the water, barely making a ripple, and kicks off from the shore. Going straight for him, the bear is covering the distance so fast he only has seconds left. With barely the strength to keep himself afloat, the boy knows he'll never be able to outswim this creature. Instead, he takes a deep breath and looks up at the woods, remembering all of the happy moments he'd spent in there with his father. A current swells beneath the boy and almost throws him out of the water. An enormous shadow flies through the depth beneath him. A whale? It couldn't be. 
Whatever it is, the shadow is swimming straight at the advancing bear. So fixated on its prey, the bear doesn't even notice what's approaching until it's too late. The ocean explodes. A blast of water as tall as the cliffs themselves shoots up into the air and showers the boy's head. Somewhere in the midst of the spray, a monster erupts from the depths. Snapping its jaw around the bear, it lifts the animal into the air and throws it against the cliff. The impact is so strong that a small landslide follows the bear's rolling body as it tumbles back towards the water. But the boy has eyes only for the monster emerging from the sea. Crawling up the rocks with one gnarled foot after another, the boy can hardly make sense of what he's looking at. It seems to have some kind of scaly hide, harder than the rocks surrounding it. A wave crashes against the monster as it leers over the bear and sinks its teeth into the animal's hide. Unable to look away, the boy kicks out and starts swimming away up the coast. Only once he's a long way around the bay does he dare to clamber out and back onto land. That night, once the rest of the tribe have gone to sleep, the boy can't help but lie wide awake in his tent. Without his father here, it's just… it's not the same. Quietly rolling up the high doorway, the boy slips out into the night. They're camped by a small cave with beautiful smooth walls inside. They say it's the cave of their ancestors, the place where all life started. The fire in the cave has to always burn. Fortunately for him, the cave is empty. The boy stares up at the wall in wonder finger drawings of animals, hunters, mothers, shamans, gods, and forests fill almost every part of it. Only one space remains in the corner, the finger painting of the rocky cliffs with the swelling sea beneath. Dipping his finger into the paint, the boy sits by the wall and starts to paint. A terrible monster crawling out of the sea, with a scaly hide stronger than any rock. That's it. You know that from just some finger painting. The archaeologist turns to the group of researchers surrounding him in the cave. UV lights are set up all along the walls, with the blue and violet shapes revealed all across the stonework. The archaeologist can't help but empathize with the spiritualism of their long-forgotten ancestors who lived in these caves thousands of years ago. The professor was the one who asked the question. A cold woman, standing well over six feet tall with a crop of fiery ginger hair. To him, she seems less of a scientist and more of a military leader. But what does he know? Walk with me, she says and leads him out of the cave. Personnel fills the surrounding area, most of them are armed. Cranes lift huge sheets of reinforced lead plating into place. Several mysterious vats line the edge of the forest, each adorned with more warning and hazard signs than you'd see in a nuclear power station. The two of them have to pause for a moment as three tanks roll past them. The archaeologist breaks the silence. You know the reason I started all my research in the first place? Did I ever tell you that story? Every early civilization in the world, whether it's ancient China, Mesopotamia, South America, Northern Europe, all these cultures, you take a look at their mythology and what do you find? The professor ignores him, instead choosing to bark orders at a group of agents talking over coffee. They all immediately dump their drinks and get back to work. What one thing do they all talk about, even though it never existed? Dragons. All these disparate people with no contact with one another, all of them still draw pictures of dragons. The professor stops walking at the edge of the cliff. The pair of them stand there, surveying the vast ocean stretching out in front of them as researchers, agents, and workers rush around behind them. After a long pause, the professor asks him to proceed. In ancient Hebrew texts, when they talk about God creating the world in seven days, what happens on day five? The professor flicks the hair out of her eyes and replies curtly, God created fish in the sea and birds in the sky. Well, not exactly. Look at the original Hebrew. He created all of the fish that teem in the seashore, but he also created Leviathan serpent-like monster from the depths, as old as the world itself. You think that's what we're dealing with? Maybe. Or something worse. By nightfall, preparations are operational. Enormous floodlights switch on, one after another, illuminating an enormous steel box with an open lid at the top, surrounded by armed agents, huge net launchers, and several tanks. It all seems a bit excessive as far as the archaeologist is concerned. He isn't officially still supposed to be here. But in all of the scramble for the Foundation to get the capture site ready, no one noticed that he had stuck around. From the viewing platform several hundred meters away, he has to watch it all unfold through a pair of binoculars. Out above the water, suspended from one of the cranes, is an elephant carcass. The professor told him that the Foundation had even marinated it for extra flavor. He had only been recruited into this project a couple of months ago, but from what he could tell, it's been an ongoing priority for the Foundation for several years now. The scale of the operation of just setting up at this site is already mind-boggling, but they've been chasing up leads like this for years now. 
Arriving at scenes, they suspect this creature has been sighted in the past and setting up traps for it. He was only brought in out of desperation. The Foundation had exhausted all recent hunting grounds and was trying to cast the net even wider. He'd just been quietly working on his university research paper about ancient reptile drawings when the agents had let themselves into his office. But staring through his binoculars now, the archaeologist knows there's no chance of this operation actually working. They have floodlights for crying out loud. No intelligent predator would come anywhere near that elephant carcass. Movement. Not in the waters or any of the lit up areas. No, there's something in the forest line, just behind a group of researchers. He reaches instinctively for his walkie-talkie, then stops himself. How many times had he got jittery before and reported something preemptively? The agents already don't take him seriously as it is. He can't be jumping at shadows. But there it is again, a shape moving fast through the trees. He scans the binoculars this way and that, trying to find it. Just a group of researchers there, some agents there, supply crates, researchers, agents… wait, weren't there more of them a second ago? He looks closer. Someone's gone missing. He clicks on the radio. Uh, South Lookout Team, report in. Nothing. South Lookout Team? A sickening feeling settles in his stomach. With all those bright lights everywhere, they're casting a lot of dark shadows. He has to do something fast. Running down from the lookout point, the archaeologist takes off running through the trees to the site. He holds his radio up to his mouth as he goes, trying to get anyone to respond. But it's hopeless. The thicket cracks and crunches under his feet as he tries to make his way through the dark woods, ignoring the feeling that crawls up his neck of being watched. A boulder blocks his way. The archaeologist grabs onto it with both hands and hauls himself on top of it, stopping for a moment to catch his breath. From up here, he can see the floodlit capture site. The tanks and cranes still sit rumbling ready to go at a moment's notice, but he can't see any ground crew anymore. He switches the radio to the open channel and calls out for anyone to respond. The professor's voice crackles back at him. What are you still doing here? This is a highly dangerous operation that you don't have clearance for. He yells at her to cancel it. They need to evacuate the site immediately. It's compromised. She laughs derisively and cuts off the channel. No, she has to believe him. People are dying, and more of them will if she doesn't… The archaeologist whispers to himself in the darkness. It's no monster. It's just an innocent creature. You're playing with a power you don't understand. It's strange. For a moment, he swears he almost hears a voice whispering something back to him in the woods. But when he looks around, he's all on his own. He has to keep moving. The creature could be anywhere. Hopping off the jagged boulder, the archaeologist takes off running through the forest once more, looking over his shoulder every few steps. The light must be playing tricks on him. In the darkness, he can't see the boulder he was standing on a moment ago anywhere. He bursts out of the tree line and into the clearing right next to the steel box. A ramp leads up to the top of it, with a large trap door suspended over the open lid. Well, if he wants to be seen and heard, that's where he needs to go. The archaeologist runs up the ramp and waves his hands wildly in the air. The tanks all turn their turrets to aim at him. The crane holding the enormous steel lid for the enclosure looms menacingly above his head. And there, marching out onto the field, looking absolutely furious, is the professor. Her red hair looks more like a ball of flames right now. We need to evacuate the site now! It's here! She snarls and marches up the ramp to meet him, jabbing a finger in the archaeologist's face. He suddenly realizes how much taller she is. You are not jeopardizing our one chance of catching this thing. Get out of the way, or I will have you detained. Besides, what evidence do you have? But the archaeologist isn't looking at her. Instead, his eyes stare in horror at the elephant carcass suspended behind her. There was a huge, reptilian bite mark taken out of it. A testing bite, like the ones given by sharks. She turns to follow his gaze, and all of her rage is washed away in a sickening delight. It's here. A scream from the crane holding the elephant makes them both jump, but by the time they look up at the cabin, all they see is a hulking shadow leaping away into the darkness. The professor clicks on her walkie-talkie and starts issuing commands. No one responds, except the tank crews. She tries again. Radio silence. Now the gravity of the situation really starts to hit her. Eyes wide with panic, she runs off down the ramp, barking into her radio and leaving the archaeologist up here on his own. Suddenly, under all of these lights, he feels very exposed. It could be anywhere in the shadows. Footsteps, heavy, planted footsteps tremor through the ground, and out of the woods walks the creature. Several meters long, fat from all of its hunting, the beast that would soon be known as SCP-682 slinks into view. It looks up at him, standing there on the trap door over a metal box, and looks like it's almost ready to laugh at how easy this will be. Boom! 
The tank blast hits the creature square in the torso, knocking it sideways. Boom! 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 The three tanks open fire one after the other, laying round after round into the colossal reptile, kicking more and more dust into the air. Before long, there's a crater in the ground so large that it looks almost like an asteroid hit it. Smoke and dust fill the air. The archaeologist's eyes fill with tears. That majestic creature, roaming the earth long before mankind ever did, exterminated just like that. Cowards. That's what people really are. Cowards. But as the dust clears, a groaning sound echoes around the clearing. The archaeologist shields his eyes and peers into the crater as best he can. But there's nothing there. Boom! He wheels around and almost falls backwards in shock. The SCP is snuck through the haze and leapt onto one of the tanks. It bites and tears at the armored bodywork, doing all it can to destroy it. In a panic, two of the tanks point toward one another and fire, destroying themselves in the process. The creature rounds on the remaining tank and bites down hard on the barrel. The tank fires, the round going straight down the monster's throat and exploding inside its gut. The backdraft from the blast shoots back through the tank, and a puff of smoke trails out of the hatch at the top. And suddenly, once again, the clearing is quiet. Turning back to the archaeologist, SCP-682 slinks towards him, smoke still curling up out of his leering teeth. With heavy, thunking steps, it climbs the ramp towards him, stopping just short of the trap door. The two of them stare each other in the eye, predator and prey. Neither move for a moment. Then it opens its mouth. The archaeologist closes his eyes. Do you know that you disgusting creatures deserve this? He opens them. Did the monster just speak? What do they hope to accomplish by attacking me? He gulps hard. That whisper he heard in the woods. The rock he'd been standing on. They're scientists. Scientists always try to learn more things, understand the world better. We think you can't be killed, so we're there testing their hypothesis. The creature growls. The stench of rotten flesh fills the archaeologist's nose. It takes a step towards him, then another. The archaeologist runs. He'll leap off the other end of the platform. It's a big jump, but he can make it. The predator's breath is on the back of his neck. He jumps, just as the trap door gives way. With an enormous thud, the SCP falls into the steel enclosure. Before it has a chance to move, the crane unhitches the steel lid, and it crashes down into place, sealing the monster inside. The archaeologist lands in the dirt and rolls onto his back to see the professor, wild-eyed and cheering, up in the crane's cabin. He lies there on his back, panting and staring up at the stars. A clunking sound echoes through the clearing, and the gurgle of a liquid flowing through pipes. He sits up, adrenaline still pumping through him. The professor has plugged a pipe into the metal enclosure and is running gallons and gallons of liquid into it. He follows the tube with his eyes, all the way to the enormous hazardous vats on the edge of the clearing. Hydrochloric acid. His eyes widen in horror. The professor laughs at him. Come on, cheer up. We're just scientists, that's what you said. Just testing a hypothesis. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-4434, Anglerfish. <laughs>